Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Vantage Seminar. We're just so happy to see you during this holiday season. And today we're finishing our, our series of talks on abelian varieties with complex multiplication. And this talk today will be by Ben Monin on Jacobians with complex multiplication. And uh, please feel free to ask Ben during questions during the talk. So uh, Ben, is it all right for us to video this talk? Yep, that's fine, yep. Oh, great, please go ahead. Okay, well, well, first of all, thank you so much for inviting me to uh, talk in this uh, seminar. It's uh, really an honor. Um, and I was asked to uh, just talk a little bit about uh, Jacobians with complex multiplication, which I do with great pleasure. Um, to be honest, I should also say that this is a topic that I haven't been actively working on myself in, say, last eight or 10 years. And uh, so my talk will mainly have the, the, the character of a, like an, an introduction into uh, the, this, this area. And I apologize in advance if, uh, you know, doesn't contain too many uh, recent contributions of my, of my own. And, um, but um, yeah, I still uh, hope you, you, can, you can enjoy this. So um, the, the, the story that I want to talk about uh, really starts with the, uh, in the mid eighties uh, with uh, Robert Coleman. And uh, in, 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 a, in a paper from which I'll, I'll, I'll quote here. So let me see if the, yeah. So this is actually a, a, a short quote from a paper that was published in 87. Um, and uh, the, the, the conjecture that he states there is the following. We, you fix an integer, at least four, and you look at curves just really over the complex numbers of genus G uh, with the requirement that the Jacobian is a CM abelian variety. And his conjecture is that there should be, for a fixed G, there should be only finitely many of such curves. Okay. Now, um, I don't know, some of you may have seen this conjecture before and you may even have thought about it. But if you have not, if this is new, then at least I would immediately wonder like, okay, where does this come from? Why this conjecture? Uh, why is he requiring G at least four? Um, I would also be inclined to ask myself, would Sarah call this a conjecture or would, would he call it, prefer to call it a problem? Or, <laughs> you know, how solid is this, you know? And I'll, I'll, I'll try to, to address these uh, during the talk, yeah? Okay, so now um, to make sure that uh, we're sort of on the same uh, level uh, with respect to terminology and basic notions, let me very quickly recall a couple of uh, things. Well, first of all, a lot of uh, this talk will, will be about uh, abelian varieties of CM type or CM abelian varieties terminology uh, varies a little bit. And uh, probably you've all seen this before, but let me quickly take you through this. Uh, you know, we say that, that if you have an abelian, uh, abelian variety um, of dimension G, uh, in fact, this could be done over any basis or any field, um, then you say there's a CM abelian variety. If the endomorphism algebra, so that's the thing I call end with the zero on top, that's the endomorphism algebra. So with Q coefficients, if that contains a commutative semi-simple algebra of degree 2G over Q. And that's saying basically that the, 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 the endomorphism algebra is somehow as large as it could be. Um, so you can break this up. Yeah, if, 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 if the abelian variety is simple, um, then it actually means that the endomorphism algebra contains a field of degree 2G over Q. And if you're incorrect to 6, 0, it actually is equivalent to saying that N0 is a field of degree 2G over Q. Um, and uh, then in general, you know, you can, you can pull apart your abelian variety into simple factors. And then A has CM if all factors have CM, okay? Right. Um, of course, I'm a student of ORT, and ORT will always tell you that you have to be careful if, if you want to do this over a non-algebraically closed field. Uh, you know, obviously, it can happen that over a very small field, you don't see these endomorphisms yet. We all know examples, right? But I'll, I'll typically be working, actually, over the complex numbers in this talk. And um, let me also point out that if I say curve, I don't think any other curves will come up, but usually curve will for me really mean a complete non-singular curve. Yeah, I hope all this be clear from the context. 
Okay, so now, of course, I mean, we have these two moduli spaces, MG and AG, the moduli of curves and the moduli of abelian varieties. These, in some sense, are the two most classical examples of moduli spaces. And of course, we have this very nice map going from the one to the other, which is the map that uh, sends the class of a curve to the class of its Jacobian. And that map is called the Torelli map. And it's a very classical theorem that this is injective on points, really on C value points. And away from the hyperelliptic locus is actually even an embedding. Yeah. So now one piece of notation that uh, it, it, it helps if you can if you can memorize this. So I'll, I'll write TG for the Torelli locus. So that's, this will be the, 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 the closed sub variety of AG1, which you get as an image. And then the TG with the little circle on top is the open Torelli locus. So the actual image of this Torelli map. Yeah, that will, that will play a role in, in uh, things I'm going to talk about. Okay. And in fact, we understand the geometry quite well because actually what you're missing, so I'm, I'm saying there's the open Torelli locus and the closed one and the boundary, that's actually the locus where your uh, principally polarized abelian variety becomes decomposable really with its polarization, yeah? And these come from curves of compact types, really like chains of curves uh, where you get the product of the Jacobians of the factors. Okay. Now, we're talking today about Jacobians with complex multiplication. And let me start with something very basic. Does it even ever happen that a Jacobian has complex multiplication? Because, you know, uh, for all we know, there might be reasons why this actually never happens, and, and then we can immediately stop. And, um, there, yeah, the answer is yes. Is, uh, you, you, you can write down Jacobians with CM, uh, and, and here, here's a way to do it. Uh, you just take a genus and you, you let n be 2g plus 1, and then you just look at the curve y, given by y to the n is x, x minus 1. Okay, so that's very explicit. And in fact, what, what I'm writing down here is a cyclic cover of degree n over p1. And um, we, I'll, I'll, I'll use j sub n for the Jacobian of this curve. Yeah. Now, you, I mean, you see that there is this uh, action of the cyclic group, yeah, because you can just multiply the y by, by an nth root of unity. And uh, so in any case, what we get is an action of the, of the group ring of Q and then of the cyclic group uh, acting on that uh, Jacob. And now something happens, which is actually quite typical for all the examples. Also, many of the examples we're going to see later is that actually these Jacobians typically are not simple. Well, depending on N, I mean, if N is prime, yes, but if N has divisors, say if, if I have a D which divides N, then it's obvious that I have a map from CN to CD, you know, just raise Y to the power uh, N over D. Um, and that of course on Jacobians gives you a map the other way around. And now it's, 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 it's a good thing to define the new part or some people would even call it the prim part or the primitive part. I, I don't care so much about terminology here, but I'll define it as JN and then with a new on top. And it's just, it's the Jacobian JN and then modulo all the stuff that you get from uh, proper divisors of N. Of course, I mean the properly dividing N. So you mod out all the sort of smaller Jacobians. And now uh, you, you uh, do a little bit of uh, algebra because you say, well, okay, that group algebra that X is actually a product of cyclotomic fields. Um, we have up to isogeny, my Jacobian actually decomposes as the product of all these new parts. And you can, I mean, this is compatible with this uh, decomposition of the algebra. And then a little calculation tells me that uh, the dimension of the new part at index D is exactly half of the uh, degree of the cyclotomic field. And so now explicitly we see that this gives us an example where all these factors uh, are in fact uh, CM abelian variety uh, and, and, and therefore the JM is a CM abelian variety. Okay, so I hope this is clear. And yeah, well, you can say that was pretty easy, was very explicit. 
Uh, and now comes the challenge uh, for you, and that's actually construct other examples. And you will find out, uh, well, unless I am missing something, but you will find out that uh, uh, I've taken away sort of the easy example and all that's left now is, is quickly becoming a lot, a lot more difficult. Um, I mean, of course, there are some curves with ha which have lots of automorphisms. And if you're lucky, you might find something. So from our curves, for instance, they have uh, CM Jacobians. Um, but I mean, in general, let's say it, it now becomes very hard to write down further examples explicitly. Yeah. All right. Uh, ben, there's a question in the chat um, about whether Ooh. the J news are simple abelian varieties from Leon Duan. Yes. The, 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 the new parts are simple. Um, and this actually now follows because I have this very big field acting on them. You know, well, it's not okay. It doesn't properly follow from 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 that fact, uh, but I think yes, you can prove that these new parts uh, are in fact simple. Now, I hope I'm not making. No, I think they're always simple. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks for the question. I, I'm I'm not. Let's say I'm I'm pretty sure that actually, if you if you do the arithmetic, you'll find that they're actually yeah, simple. Yeah. Okay. So let me turn to one question that I find very, very important. And this is, where does this come from? I mean, why would you write down such a conjecture? Yeah. And actually Coleman himself, I, I gave you a quote from his paper. Uh, and then actually the, the paper, this is another quote. This is actually the next paragraph of that same paper. And uh, there Coleman gave some motivation. Yeah? He says, well, um, why should he make that conjecture? And he says, well, this is an analog of the Mann and Mumford conjecture. And, and then he, he gives a, this a rationale because he says the ZM points on the moduli space are analogous to torsion points. And then he has some, some arguments in, in, in favor. Okay. So clearly there is a kind of analogy uh, underlying this. And uh, well, that analogy actually brings me to two other well-known mathematicians, Manin and Mumford, yeah, because as uh, Coleman already mentioned, somehow uh, he found inspiration in this uh, manin mumford conjecture. So let's recall, what was that about? The manin mumford conjecture, uh, I, I think it was formulated by them independently, and then it was first proven by Renault in 83. And it was the following problem, you take a curve, not, not genus zero or one. So genus a hyperbolic curve, genus at least two. Let's say uh, you, you uh, take a base point and you embed using the base point as usual, you embed the curve in its Jacobian. And now you, you, now you look for how many torsion points the curve will hit. And of course, I mean, that might be a, a non-trivial set because I can still uh, choose my, my, my base point and who knows, maybe I'll hit some torsion points. But uh, the set of torsion points on the image of C is finite. Yeah? So even though these torsion points on the Jacobian, they, they lie everywhere then, somehow the curve manages to, to miss almost all of them. Yeah? And as said, that, that was first proven by uh, Reno. And um, indeed, that leads to a nice analogy. But I mean, of course, it's only uh, something, it's some kind of speculation. So let me put a question mark here. Uh, but what the analogy would then be is that sort of on the left side, you could look at abelian varieties with torsion points sitting in them. And then you could look at a curve embedded into a Jacobian. And then you have the Mann and Mumford theorem, which uh, saying that sort of C misses almost all all the torsion points. And on the right-hand side, then, uh, we would replace the abelian variety by the moduli space of abelian varieties. Uh, the an analog of the torsion points would be, then be the CM points, so the points where the abelian variety has CM. Uh, and then we could embed MG into uh, AG1, so uh, by the Torelli map. And then you see indeed that there is this nice analogy and that Coleman's conjecture is somehow uh, similar to, to Mann and Mumford. Yeah. With the 
big difference that on the left we have a solid theorem and on the right we have a, con a conjecture. Yeah. And in fact, it turns out that there, there, is a, there is a more general, well, in fact, nowadays, uh, Mann and Mumford has been proven in, in, in several ways and there are all sorts of stronger variants, but let me mention a variant that was already proven by Reno and that is, is already in its statement more general than, than the classical uh, problem. And for this version, let me make a definition. Um, and let me say that if you have an abelian variety, then uh, I call translates of abelian subvarieties over torsion points. Let me call those guys special subvarieties. Okay. And if if you accept this terminology, then um, what uh, Reno proved is that if you have an, an irreducible subvariety of an abelian variety, uh, then it's special if and only if the torsion points are dense. So risky dense. Yeah. So the subvarieties which which hit a dense collection of uh, torsion points, they are in fact only the, the abelian subvarieties uh, up to translation by over torsion points. Okay. Now, if you put this back into the analogy, yeah, then you see that on the left hand, um, these these varieties that contain lots of torsion points, uh, we, we understand what they are. And uh, you, could, you could wonder if this, this also has an analog on, on the right-hand side. And in fact, it has, and we will just call them again, special subvarieties. I hope this will not be confusing because this is a, the, the terminology special subvariety will have now a meaning in, in two settings. I'll, I'll, I'll define for you what I mean. And uh, if all is correct, then those should be the subvarieties in which the CM points are dense. This is just speculation for the time being. But uh, in fact, we, we can give a proper definition of this. And so in the setting of the moduli space of abelian varieties, um, the, the definition that is now commonly used is that an irreducible algebraic subvariety we call it a special subvariety if it's an irreducible component of a Shimura variety, subvariety. Yeah? And of course, for many people, this is not at first glance an easy definition to understand because it, you know, it, it uses this whole language of uh, Shimura varieties. And um, okay, and uh, so what can you do about it? Well, uh, there's. In fact, two things I can do. Um, I can try to say a little bit more about that definition, you know. And the other thing is, we can also look for characterizations of special subvarieties by certain properties uh, that maybe make this notion a little bit uh, easier to, to digest. Yeah. And I'll try to do uh, both. Um, so first of all, maybe, maybe let me spend a minute on, on the actual definition in the language of Shimura subvarieties. Yeah? Um, what it means, if, if, if you have a bit of a background in, 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 in Hodge theory, uh, then it actually means that what we call special subvarieties of AG, that these are the Hodge loci. Yeah? And it means the following. Over AG, we have a universal family of abelian varieties. These abelian varieties, they have cohomology groups. And in fact, for an abelian variety, it's the first cohomology group that sort of determines everything. And from this, these cohomology groups, they, they have Hodge structures and you can form say tensor products and so on. And you can look for, for uh, classes and ask whether they are Hodge classes. So PP classes, which are rational. And uh, if you move the abelian variety, you know, and you fix a certain class in cohomology and you follow it, uh, then depending on your where you are in your parameter space, uh, some particular cohomology class may or may not be uh, a Hodge class. And the loci over which they are, uh, where the jumps occurs, where certain classes are Hodge classes, they are referred to as Hodge loci. And the maximal such loci, they are actually turn out to be uh, irreducible algebraic subvarieties. And it's those guys uh, that are the, the, the special subvarieties. Yeah. So 
all this is not so easy to completely understand. Uh, another approach would be to actually dive into the world of uh, Shimura varieties and, uh, you know, uh, as many of you will know, I mean, there's the notion of a Shimura variety. It really, uh, by Deline, it was formulated in a, in a very much in a group theoretic language. And it means that uh, these Shimura varieties, they really come from certain data, starting with a, a reductive group of irrational numbers and then an associated uh, Hermitian symmetric uh, domain. And um, in, 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 in that language, uh, you, you, can define, you can see this notion of a special subright. Yeah. Uh, what, what, the reason that I mentioned this, I'm not going to explain it obviously, but I mean, the reason that I want to mention this is that this is the kind of language that brings algebraic groups into the game. And it will also enable you in some cases to actually do a little bit of a classification because I mean, these are pretty rigid data uh, that you can try to, 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 to classify. And it will sometimes play a role in, in the things that I'm going to talk about. Here's the basic example. And in, in a way, this is the, the, the one example that is relatively easy to understand. Yeah. So let's just fix some ring that could act on an abelian variety. And, just let's look at all abelian varieties that admit an action by this given ring. So just think of you know, an order in, a, in some imaginary quadratic field or whatever. And then it turns out that in the moduli space, the locus of all abelian varieties that admit an action by a given ring, that this is actually a union of irreducible algebraic subvarieties. And these individual components, these are examples of uh, special subvarieties. Uh, these are often referred to as special subvarieties of PEL type, and PEL refers to the fact that we're looking at abelian varieties with a given polarization, with given endomorphisms, and a given level structure. I personally don't like the PEL terminology so much, but it's there. Yeah. Okay, so in that example, what makes it what makes life easier is that say these cohomology classes that I was talking about that could be Hodge classes. In this particular example, they actually live simply in the endomorphism of H1, because the end of an abelian variety is isomorphic to the Hodge classes in the Hodge structure end of H1. And so it means that in this case, to ask that a particular type of Hodge class, uh, sorry, of cohomology class is, uh, is a Hodge class, it actually has a direct geometric meaning. It just means that the abelian variety has a certain uh, uh, extra endomorphism. And one of the problems is that in general, you know, uh, the, 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 if, you, if you study this from the perspective of Hodge loci, is that in general, uh, the, the cohomology classes that we're talking about are much more mysterious and they don't have an immediate geometric meaning that you can easily sort of write down. Yeah. But so, so the, 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 the interpretation uh, of these, these uh, uh, of what it means to be on a certain Hodge locus is not always so direct as simply saying that an abelian variety has certain endomorphisms. And that, that of course makes life a little bit uh, difficult here. Well, as said, I mean, you can, instead of elaborating on the definition, you can also try to characterize the, the, the subvarieties that you're interested in. And, uh, and here, uh, one theme has been always that uh, special subvarieties have a kind of linear uh, uh, structure. Uh, and again, think of the analogy with uh, the, the abelian, uh, with translates of abelian subvarieties, right? You could also think of these as being kind of linear in the, the abelian variety. And uh, something analogous is, uh, is true. Something I, I proved uh, quite some time ago is that in fact, if you have an, an algebraic subvariety, then to say that it's special, it, me it really means that it's a totally geodesic uh, 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 subvariety and it should pass through at least one CM point. I mean, this, this, this last condition uh, in, in many cases, in fact, can even be left out, but uh, well, this is, this is the statement. And, uh, and in fact, there's a, there's, this is only uh, one side of a coin. Uh, there, there's a similar characterization uh, 
in terms of uh, what's called CR Tate theory. Uh, this, this happens in mixed characteristic, uh, but I don't think I should uh, uh, go into that uh, today. But in any case, there is this uh, this 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 sort of idea that uh, special subvarieties are, in, in some sense, they are linear. Yeah. And then these two gentlemen they started thinking about such matters and. Um, Yvon Rie already, at, I think, at the, in the late 80s, had formulated a problem. And then in the early 90s, Franz Oort started thinking about the, these uh, matters. And he also formulated uh, a, a statement. And then later, he found out that a special case had already been formulated by uh, Yvon Rie, actually, the one dimensional case. And so uh, before I state uh, the result, let me first recall a very basic fact, uh, namely that uh, the CM points, if you have a special uh, subvariety, then the CM points will always lie dense. So even analytically dense. Yeah? And then uh, André uh, for, for one dimensional uh, subvarieties and, and ORT in general, uh, they formulated the conjecture. Uh, this has led to a lot of work by, lo by lots of people. Uh, the conjecture was, and now it's this theorem, that uh, an algebraic subvariety is special if and only if the CM points are uh, Zariski dense. And I say it's the theorem of, and I, and I give uh, lots of initials, well, you probably know the story. Well, you had Jacob lecturing last week. Uh, so uh, he told you a, a lot more about this, I guess. Uh, of course, there was first a, a conditional proof under, under the Riemann hypothesis. Uh, and then uh, Pila and Zimmermann developed a dif different approach. And then with a lot of input from uh, Andriata and co uh, ultimately uh, Zimmermann was the first to prove it unconditionally for the moduli space of a beam right. Yeah, so this is now a, a solid uh, theorem. And that means that now really we have this, we have sort of filled in the table. We have a very nice uh, analogy. Uh, we can talk about special subvarieties. These are the, 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 the subvarieties where the CM points are dense. And it also means that uh, you can now rephrase uh, Coleman's original conjecture. Uh, namely, it says, well, that for G big enough, and I'll come to this in a second, uh, there should be no special subvarieties that have positive dimension that are contained in the Torelli locus. And now you have to be careful because you don't want S to be fully contained in the boundary. You want to, you want to have actual Jacobians uh, on, of, of, of smooth curves, at least generically on S, yeah? And let me immediately uh, change the, the number four uh, in, in a question mark. I'll, 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 I'll get to this in a, in, a, in a minute, yeah? Okay, so that's a reformulation. And because actually this way of thinking about it, I think was uh, initiated by Oort. This is often now referred to as the, the coleman ort conjecture. Um, so very, let me very quickly take you through this. Why is this a reformulation? Yeah. Well, so let's just imagine that for some genus, you actually have infinitely many CM Jacobians. That gives you an infinite bunch of CM points in the moduli, in the Torelli locus. Yeah. You take this risky closure and uh, that will certainly then have an irreducible uh, component of positive dimension. By construction, the CM points are dense. So by only Lord, it means that the, the S you find is a special subvariety, and by construction, it's contained in the in the Torelli locus, and in fact, it meets the interior of the Torelli locus. And again, this last condition uh, is is crucial because it's very easy to construct examples uh, that are completely contained in the boundary, and and but those are not the ones that we want to look at. Yeah, so. This is uh, a reformulation now, it's equivalent to the original conjecture of Coleman. Okay, so what's known? Uh, as you have seen, I have already sometimes replaced the original conjecture uh, G at least four, I have replaced it by G bigger equal question mark. Uh, and this is not without reason because we actually know that the original problem uh, was is, is not correct for G up to seven. 
So for G up to seven, actually, we do have special subvarieties in the Torelli locus, yeah? positive dimensional. Uh, and of course, uh, Coleman himself already understood that you should not be taking G smaller than four, because then actually the Torelli locus uh, is, 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 is well, actually the close Torelli locus is the whole moduli space. Uh, this is no longer true for G at least four. This is why that pops up as a requirement uh, in, in, in Pullman's original statement. Uh, but now we know that even for G up to seven, uh, there are counterexamples. And, and let me, because it's a lot of fun. So let me very quickly take you through the, 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 what I think of as the, 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 the classical example. And um, it turns out that this example already pops up in an old paper by Shimura but in, 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 say, in this terminology, it was first explained properly by, in a paper by uh, De Jong and Noh. And, and, and here's the example. Uh, let's just look at a family of curves given by this explicit equation. It's a little bit similar to the, the, the example that I gave in the very beginning, but now we actually have one parameter, the lambda. Yeah? So y to the fifth is x, x minus one, x minus lambda. That's uh, again, a cyclic a family of cyclic covers of P1. And we have this one parameter lambda. So in the moduli space that gives you a one dimensional subvariety. These curves have genus four, yeah. And clear, uh, what you also see is that they had these curves, they have an automorphism of order five. Yeah, again, by multiplying the y by uh, a root of unity. And so uh, if you think about it, you will see that actually the cyclotomic field acts uh, on these Jacobians. And of course the cyclotomic field has degree four over Q and uh, these are four dimensional uh, uh, Jacobians. Uh, so you could say we are already halfway CM. This is already half of CM. Um, and we still have this parameter, yeah. And now you should know one thing, and let me just post it as a, as a, as a, in a general setting. Yeah, suppose I give you an abelian variety and I have a certain CM field which acts on it. And uh, I want to look at the PEL type special subvariety that this defines. Yeah. And I want to calculate the dimension. How do you do that? And the, the, the remark is that actually this doesn't just depend on the CM field but you also have to look at the corresponding CM type. And here's what you do. You look at your abelian variety, you look at the Lie algebra, so the tangent space at the origin. Well, that becomes a module under your field tensor over Q with the complex numbers, but that's just a product of copies of C according to the different embeddings of K. So that acts. That means that your tangent space at the origin decomposes according to the embeddings of uh, to the complex embeddings of your field. And now let me introduce some numbers. Let me write n sigma for the, uh, the dimension as a C vector space of the sigma isotypical component of the, the tangent space. Yeah. And then if you, you know, you have to look at the, the polarization and you will find that actually the N sigma plus the N sigma bar, the, so the complex conjugate embedding, they always add up to G, the dimension of your abelian variety. Yeah, so you should really be thinking of the embeddings of K as coming in complex conjugate pairs. And then uh, the theory of Shimura varieties will tell you that the dimension of your special uh, variety of PEL type will be, uh, you take all products n sigma times n sigma bar, and then you sum them over all pairs. That's the general recipe. So now we do uh, this in this particular example. We have genus four curves. Uh, we have the cyclotomic field acting. And what you do is you calculate the tangent space. Well, actually I'm going to do it for the dual. So I'll, I'll, I'll calculate the, the holomorphic differentials. And here is a basis for the holomorphic differentials. You know, it's dx over y squared, dx over y cubed, and so on. And now you look at these exponents because, I mean, remember the, the, cycle, the root of unity is acting on the y. So it's these exponents of the y in the denominators uh, that dictates which multiplicities we're finding in the, uh, uh, on the tangent space. And so here the embeddings are the, we're talking about the fifth roots of unity. 
So it's the one and the four that form a complex conjugate pair and the two and the three that form a, a complex conjugate pair. And I see that actually the one and the four, the one is not occurring in the red numbers at all and the four, four is occurring twice. Whereas for the pair two, three, I see that they're both occurring. So these multiplicities that I was talking about, they are zero, two for one pair and then one, one for the other pair. And that gives me, uh, uh, that tells me that my uh, PEL type special subvariety has dimension zero times two plus one times one is one. And that's great because now- Can I ask a question? Yes, please do. So, so is, is there this dimension formula for Hodge type subvarieties? Yeah, uh, you mean in general, if it's not of PEL type? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It wouldn't cycles are not algebraic. Yes, but I mean, it, it, it's not like a closed formula. I mean, uh, it's really then the, the, the theory of Shimura varieties and, 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 and the classification of what are called Shimura data. I think in any given case, if you know enough about your, uh, say, general Mumford date group, mm -hmm. uh, then yeah, you can, you, can, you, can, you can do these calculations. Yeah, so, so how does this dimension relate to the Mumford thing? Like the, like no, the... no, I mean, it's, it's really, I mean, it's really, I mean, if you, if you have the Mumford Tate group, you should also figure out what is the corresponding Hermitian domain, uh -huh. and uh, which is a non-trivial exercise to do in general. And then the, the dimension of your uh, Shimura variety will just be the dimension of that Hermitian symmetric domain. Uh, yes. And it, in, in, in individual cases, that takes a little bit of, uh, you know, uh, computing before you, you actually have the dimension. It's not, it's not something for which there's like an easy uh, general algorithm. Yeah, it, uh, so it wouldn't look like the product of these like numbers. No, no, it's not. It's not, simple. No, no, it's not something uh, elementary like uh, in this particular case. That's right. Yeah. So this formula only works for PEL type. Yeah. So really, for and in fact, I'm I'm here really only doing the case where I have a CM field that acts on an abelian variety, and then. So then if it's it, a totally real field like Hilbert, yeah, then it's already then it's already well actually totally real fields we can also do, but then it's already a completely different uh, formula. Yeah, because then it's uh, it's it's then you have to look at the dimension. Uh -huh. uh, of or, so then it would be g over the the degree of the totally real field. They call that number h, and then the dimension would be h times h plus one over two. Uh, but I know this only because I, in that particular case, no, happen to know what is the Hermitian symmetric uh, domain. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Okay, so in general, like we don't know what the formula is. I was just no, no, it's not. There's not so much a formula. Yeah, but mm -hmm. you can usually figure it out. Yes. Know? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. So, thanks for the question. Okay, so why do we win now? Uh, well, I have, first of all, I have a one parameter family of these curves. There was one parameter lambda. I see that the image is contained in a PEL type special sub variety. Yeah, because I see that these uh, Jacobians have a certain action. And I calculate that this special sub variety is also one dimensional by this thing that I just did. But that means that the Z actually must be dense in S and then you, you win because then you know that there are infinitely many CM points. In particular, now there are infinitely many parameter values at which the Jacobian has CM, yeah? By the way, that still doesn't tell you which are the CM parameters, right? Because that would still, uh, I have now only deduced that there are infinitely many of them, but this is not something that you would easily write down concretely, yeah? So that's a great game. And uh, well, you could say, well, let, uh, let, let's try to do more. So let's change the, the exponent five into a seven. I'm going to be a bit quick here, but uh, you do similar calculation. You write down the differentials. You calculate the dimension of your PEL type special sub variety. And again, you find something one dimensional and again, you win. So this is an example in genus six. But for instance, suppose I go on and I get courageous and say, well, let's look at y to the 11 is x, x minus one, x minus lambda. Then I start calculating my differentials. And this time I'll find that our, the pair zero two is occurring three times and the pair to one comma one is occurring twice. And this time I'm finding a two dimensional special sub variety. Whereas I only had one parameter lambda. So in this case, the S, the PEL type special sub variety becomes bigger than the, the thing that I have at the family that I, I'm writing down. 
And now I lose because I cannot conclude anything a priori. Yeah? And you can do this more systematically. I mean, it's uh, in view of time, let me go through this a bit quickly here now. You can systematically look, say, for families of cyclic covers of P1, where you vary branch points. Yeah. And uh, so you can, these are explicit. You can just write them down. This gives you a potentially higher dimensional sub variety of MG. Uh, you're writing down curves with a certain action of a field. Uh, you can try to do this calculation of the dimension of the, the PEL type uh, variety. And, uh, and in, if these two match, if the dimension of the, of the S is the same as the number of parameters that you have, uh, then, then, then you have an interesting example, yeah? And in principle, you can do such things on a computer. You can just now search for uh, examples uh, which was done at some point uh, by uh, a German mathematician, Rode, and I at some point also did this. And uh, that will produce at the end of the day, actually a list of such examples, uh, in general, up to seven. Yeah? I mean, it's just to indicate that we have a table. And then after this, the computer will not find anything anymore. And you start suspecting that there are no. Now, let me point out one thing. If in this particular game, if it turns out that the PEL type variety has a bigger dimension than the number of parameters in your family of curves, then you cannot conclude that this variety Z is a special sub variety. But a priori can also not conclude that it's not a special sub variety because it might just be a smaller special sub variety sitting properly inside a PEL type guide. And in this particular game where we do say families of cyclic covers of P1, um, I, actually, I actually proved that this is not the case. And so that the, the table that I showed you is actually complete. And maybe what's fun to remark is that the proof actually, uh, this is a statement uh, say over the complex numbers, but actually the, the proof is uh, completely based on uh, mixed characteristic uh, geometry using uh, techniques uh, that are due to uh, Dwarf and Elkos. Yeah. Okay, so that means in this particular case, yeah, we have found a nice game that produces some examples. And at some point uh, we get stuck and there are no new examples anymore. And so you need to come up with something, something different. Yeah. And so in this part, I want to sketch very briefly a couple of approaches by various groups of uh, people. I should apologize in advance because I mean, over the years now, there are lots and lots of papers on this. And uh, uh, if, if anybody's listening and I'm not, if, if I'm not mentioning your paper, please excuse me and uh, drop me a line to inform you, me of a, of, of a result that maybe I wasn't aware of. Uh, but at least let me sketch some global uh, approaches, yeah? Um, let me first introduce a bit of terminology because I, otherwise I have to repeat it all the time. I'll say that, a uh, that an algebraic subvariety uh, satisfies condition ST, and ST stands for special subvariety in the Torelli locus. If it's a special subvariety of positive dimension contained in the Torelli locus, and not contained fully in the boundary of the Torelli log. So it meets the interior, yeah? So uh, you'll see, I don't want to repeat this all the time, these conditions, yeah? So the goal, the Coleman Orth conjecture really says that if I take G large enough and maybe G at least eight, we don't know, uh, it should be the case that there are no sub varieties that satisfy all these conditions, yeah? Because they would be the counter examples for Coleman. Okay, well, then there is a whole, I call it the Italian team. I uh, hope they won't mind. It's a whole group of people that in various uh, uh, groups uh, have been producing lots of nice papers. They have been finding more examples uh, by varying on this game that I showed you. You know, the game was about cyclic cover families of cyclic covers of P1. Maybe you can do uh, other abelian covers or even non-abelian uh, covers of P1 where you vary branch points. Maybe it even works with uh, a curve of higher genus as a base curve. And indeed they found uh, a bunch of interesting new examples 
but all of them in genus at most seven. So there is no new record in terms of uh, the, the, the genera that we encounter. And also various members of this group have taken, uh, I would say a very differential geometric uh, approach. And here really the, the way to think about it is that uh, by analogy to the Mann and Mumford case, we more or less think that the modular space of curves should somehow be very curved, very wobbly, Whereas the special subvarieties, as I tried to indicate, should somehow be very linear things sitting inside the moduli space. And somehow, Coleman Ort, you could try to picture it as saying that, you know, this very curved Torelli locus somehow misses all the CM points. Yeah. And uh, you can try to study this at least locally by doing, you know, a little bit of deformation theory. Uh, for instance, by studying the second fundamental form. Uh, this is not easy, but uh, various people of this group have uh, obtained very nice results. Let me give you one sample. It's a recent result by uh, Frediani and uh, Pirola, but it actually improves a whole series of earlier results. And um, so they have been using these kind of techniques for instance, to get dimension bounds on potential counterexamples. Yeah? So uh, a result that they now have is uh, if you have a counterexample, yeah? so if you have an S that satisfies all these conditions, then the dimension somehow cannot be too big in relation to uh, the genus. So it's at most 2G minus one or 2G depending on the parity of uh, G. Yeah? Okay, so somehow you have huge, counterexamples uh, according to these techniques. That was a little bit, you could say that was the differential geometric take on it, yeah? because there's a lot of, uh, of differential geometry in the, in the sense of studying a, a second fundamental form. And there was also, there's also a beautiful contribution by uh, Dick Hain. You could say that's much more the topological contribution because it's it's based on a study of mapping class groups, and um, that leads to the following theorem. This is due to Hain, but actually with a very clever clever uh, later improvement uh, due to uh, De Jong and Zhang. And it says the following: um, Suppose you have a counterexample. Suppose you have a subvariety S in AG that satisfies uh, these conditions that I mentioned. And uh, well, as I said, such a special subvariety somehow comes from a Shimura datum. So there is always a Q group involved. Uh, it's actually the, the generic Mumford tape group on your variety S. And suppose that's a, a, a simple group over Q. This is actually not an, I'll, I'll come to this in, in the next slide. This is not an essential uh, condition at all, yeah? Um, and then one of the following cases should happen. Either S is a bold quotient, or it meets the boundary in co-dimension at most two. So it should have somehow a big boundary in the sense that it, in the sense of the boundary of the Torelli locus, or the Bailey Burrell boundary should be very big. Yeah. So this is the boundary in the sense of compactifying the moduli space. And Maybe to recall here, um, yeah, so these, these special subvarieties, they are always like locally symmetric uh, varieties. And you say that it's a bulk quotient if the, if the uniform, as they, uh, say if the, if, the, uh, uh, if the simply connected cover is, is the complex n ball. Yeah, so if it's uniformized by uh, the complex n ball. So for instance, uh, we all know the, the usual upper lower half plane upper half plane as a Hermitian symmetric domain uh, has different realizations and via a Möbius transformation, you can also realize it as the open uh, disk. So uh, that, that's, that's, that's the one ball, yeah? So for instance, every one dimensional guy is a, is a ball quotient. And in fact, all the known examples, all known counterexamples in uh, dimension up to seven, as far as I'm aware, they're all ball, ball quotients. But I should also point out, these are not necessarily of PEL type. There is no reason why even in the one dimensional case, 
Uh, I mean, one dimensional sounds simple, but there's no reason why these, these would always be uh, also simple in a modular sense. Okay, so uh, Hain um, gives, gives this nice result and you can improve a little bit on this because obviously if we are looking for counterexamples, you can just look for minimal counterexamples. Uh, this is a, something that I uh, have, have been talking about a little bit already uh, some, some time ago, but I'm not sure if this definition appears anywhere in the literature. You can just say, well, uh, by minimal, I mean that I have a positive dimensional special subvariety that does not properly contain uh, a smaller one that still has positive dimension. And um, clearly, if I'm looking for counterexamples, it suffices to look for a minimal counterexamples. And, um, and in that case, the, the, the underlying group theory becomes a little bit uh, easier because then the, the algebraic group uh, that occurs will actually be a, a simple group over, over the rational numbers, which you can describe, and then you can try to use a bit of classification theory and so on. And so I think at the end of the day, uh, with the help of uh, the results of uh, Hain, I think you get sort of a, a, a list of some essential cases that you have to worry about. And these are really low dimensional special subvarieties. They could pop up as counterexamples. It's ball quotients that are sort of popping up. And there's one other type, uh, let me not go into this, but uh, there's a particular Lee type A1 or B2, because these are the only cases that have a big Bailey Borel uh, boundary, yeah? Uh, so there's a bit of room there for uh, further analysis. And I think in fact, uh, you can even restrict to compact ball quotients in the sense of having complete varieties that don't meet the boundary, um, but this is not great. Okay, and maybe a last contribution uh, before I finish is uh, there has been a lot of work by, uh, well, I can't call it the German school or the German team, but it's Kangzuo uh, with various collaborators in, in various groups. And uh, at the origin of their work, uh, you could say their work is mostly, well, how to call it, maybe of a Hodge theoretical nature. Um, so it's very easy to, uh, to give you the basic idea. Uh, and this is just, well, suppose, suppose I have a one dimensional counterexample. So where I would have a curve, now potentially open curve as a, as a parameter space, and that would give me a family of abelian varieties over it. And now there's something that's called the uh, Arakelov uh, inequality. And what you do is simply this, you, you have the, the, the complete model of your base curve. Uh, you, you're adding a couple of points. Uh, let me call the missing points S. And I now realize that this was a very unclever uh, choice of notation, apologies. Um, and then in fact, uh, the, the, the H1 of the abelian varieties, you can actually formulate this in, in, in terms of the notion of a Higgs bundle. Okay, so you have these two components. These are the usual one zero and zero one components. So the, the easy one zero is just a, a push forward of the, of the differentials. Um, that will give you a Higgs bundle that just describes how the Hodge structure varies if you move over the basis. And this all nicely extends uh, to bundles over the compactified uh, curve. And then the theory of Higgs bundles will tell you that you can decompose this into like a flat part, which is essentially like a constant part and a part where really things are moving and where the one zero component is ample. Don't worry too much about the details. I'm, I'm trying, just trying to take you through the, the essential thing because the essential thing is then that there is, uh, if you look at it closely, you will see that there is a, a, an inequality that already shows up in the work of Arkhelov. Uh, and this really now uses the degrees of bundles on the base curve. Yeah? So the degree that shows up here is really the degree of vector bundles over a, a complete base curve. And what Vivek and Zuo uh, showed is that in fact, under a little bit of technical uh, assumptions, let me let me rush over this, that if you're in a situation where this Arakelov inequality is an equality, uh, then that actually characterizes special subvarieties. 
And so this gives a completely different approach to recognizing when something is uh, a special subvariety. And they have been using this, you know, let me just quickly summarize this now. Uh, they have been using this to uh, prove lots of interesting things about the non-existence of particular types of special subvarieties. It, it doesn't so much lead to like an almost complete answer, but uh, the, the technique is very interesting. And let me just uh, maybe give you one sample of something that they, they have been able to, to prove. So this is a result by Lu and Zuo. And for instance, they show that for G bigger than seven, that's exactly the bound we expect. Uh, you cannot have one dimensional special subvarieties in the hyper elliptic locus. Yeah, that, that's something they can control uh, quite well uh, with these uh, techniques. And now, in fact, in preparing this talk, I realized that if you combine this with this, the things by Hain that I uh, showed you, uh, then th I think actually you can, uh, you, can, you can sharpen this a little bit and remove the assumption that it's only a special curve. So I think actually you can deduce now that in the hyper elliptic locus, uh, say the coleman ort conjecture is, is true. Of course, this is a bit special uh, because the hyper elliptic locus has its own uh, characteristics, but uh, well, it shows you that there's a bit of uh, progress. So I would say to conclude, maybe we can start calling it conjecture. <laughs> seems, you know, that there is at least now, uh, I would say in comparison to 25 years ago, there's a, there's a reasonable amount of evidence in, in favor of it. And of course, we have no idea what exactly is the bound on the genus. You know, I wouldn't be too surprised if tomorrow something comes up with a genus 11 counter example, but then we just increase the lower bound. And uh, I think as a conjecture, it's, uh, it's quite reasonable. And, uh, but of course, I have no further idea of uh, how to prove it. And maybe that's a good time moment for me to stop and to thank you for your attention. And uh, well, please shoot if you have questions. Oh, thanks. Well, thanks for that wonderful talk. The result at the end is really great. Uh, are there any questions at this point? I have a question. Sure. So, so can you do any of this over like mixed characteristic, or is it just does it only make sense? Because you're doing car zero, right? Yeah. So there, there, there are two ways I can interpret your your question. First of all, on the level of available techniques, mixed characteristics is actually very helpful, uh, and. Already when all this started, I mean, in my thesis, I, I, I proved results in reference to this note, this idea of uh, linearity that actually um, where even the formulation of the result happens in mixed characteristic. Yeah, using certain right. tools. Right. Like so, so one answer to your question is yes, mixed characteristics might give you extra techniques, extra tools, and in particular, uh, you know, Certate theory uh, can, can be a great tool to uh, study locally uh, the deformation theory and so on. Mm -hmm. Now there's also another interpretation of the question, which I could actually fire back at all of you. Can we find interesting count, new counterexamples just purely in positive characteristics? You know, because uh, I think with a little bit of work, uh, you can still make sense of the notion of a special subvariety, or just for that matter, restrict attention to PEL type special subvarieties. It's a little bit more delicate and positive characteristic, but of course, there are many more interesting families, of course. Yeah, yeah. you also have more cycles in positive characteristics, so it should be. Yeah, and I, I would already find it interesting if somebody is able to uh, write down additional examples in, in positive characteristics. And um, so far, I haven't been able to do that. You know, you can look at curves with, uh, you know, large automorphism groups, obviously, and so on, and hope that maybe they will give you something. Uh, so far, I have not succeeded, but uh, 
please have, have a oh, try uh, and let so me know. There's a question. <laughs> so someone is asking uh, what, what should special point mean in positive characters? I can say what I mean by it. I just mean something that's reduction mod P of a CN point. Yeah, but I think that's actually, what I mean, but maybe that's not the best. Uh, I, 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 I think actually already if you look at PEL type situations, uh -huh. you should actually be studying, you should actually be studying uh, the loci where you have a particular type of anamorphism ring. Yes. Uh, you, you, you can make sense of this. And yeah. one, one thing that becomes more delicate in characteristic P is that the actual ring and not the Q algebra will make will will uh, play a role? Um, you, yes, the integral version. Because yes. uh, it's it's really the integral ring that you should fix. So mm -hmm. the notions involved are become a little bit more delicate. But uh, I think at least for the PEL situation, it makes sense. Uh, and this is not the same as just looking at reductions uh, of characteristic zero. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. Well, let's see. Taylor, do you want to ask your question aloud or would, do you want me to read it? You can read it, Rachel. Thank you. I can I can read it. So uh, so the question was uh, to clarify Andre Ort doesn't imply Coleman, or at least we don't have a proof that it does. No, 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 because because uh, uh, no, because uh, actually all that Andre Ort, well, all, I mean, of course, it's a, it's a tremendously deep uh, result, but uh, all that it gives you is this reformulation of the original uh, conjecture, the, the one that was originally phrased by Coleman. Uh, I mean, because Coleman just looked at uh, isomorphism classes of curves whose Jacobian has CM. And uh, the step we're making on the basis of Andre Ort is that we are actually rephrasing that problem as a problem about moduli spaces, where we have this Torelli locus inside the moduli of abelian varieties. And we're asking whether it happens that there are special varieties completely say in this Torelli locus. Um, that, that's what you get from, from, from Andre Ord. But uh, other than that, I don't, uh, you know, I. And, then, and in fact, we have seen counterexamples, yeah? So we've seen that, yes, for low G, this, this may actually happen. Yeah, that's, um, yeah. No, it's a good question. And I, uh, but, but I'm, 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 as far as I can see, we have sort of used, we've used Andre Ort now and um, it, 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 it leads to a different perspective on the problem. Uh, but I don't see how it's going to help as such to, uh, to yeah. Oh, great. And um, Armand asked whether it would be possible to have a variant of the last result for the super elliptic locus of cyclic covers of P1. Um, oh, that's interesting. Um, oh, that's a cool question. Yeah, related. Uh, actually, yeah, so let's see. Ooh, you, 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 you. Okay. Actually, I should also be very modest about, I mean, my only contribution is to make the step from one dimensional to arbitrary dimension. And this is just an application of, of things you can learn from, um, from Hain, where, whereas the original result of Lu and Zuo about no one dimensional examples in the hyperelliptic locus, that really uses these uh, Argelov uh, uh, inequalities. And can we generalize this to the super, um, Great question. I, at a, I, right now, I don't know. I, I would need to look more closely in their paper, but uh, yeah, maybe, maybe yes. Maybe yes. Yeah, another possible generalization might be for just um, curves that are double covers of, a, of another curve as opposed to being double covers of P1. That might be an interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so the Italians, if I may call them as a group uh, like that, um, they they have really extensively been been playing with further examples. Um, of course, there's a little price to pay, namely if you start playing with families of covers of some uh, some base curve. That's interesting. Uh, well, first of all, it will it will rapidly push up the genus. 
yeah, in, in, in your Hurwitz formula. And secondly, uh, the Jacobian of the base curve will always be a factor of the Jacobians that you're finding. And so you can only do this over a base curve that itself has CM, you know, whose Jacobian has CM. Uh, but yeah, I, I think I think uh, for elliptic curves as a base curve, they, they, they have been successful. And I, I in the past, I have also tried to 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 even find examples with a base curve of genus two or higher. And I've never been. I, I don't believe we have any examples of that. Yeah. But yeah, a lot. I mean, you know, there's lots of room for figuring out new games where that could maybe lead to uh, to examples. Yeah. Wonderful. All right. Are there any, any other questions? Okay. Well, let's thank Ben again. My pleasure. Well, thank you all. Nice to be part of your seminar.